Welcome to Amazon Legends, where we have real stories about making it big on Amazon. Our guests are CEOs of large companies and entrepreneurs who became power sellers. Also providers specializing in helping sellers, aggregators that acquire sellers, and former Amazonians will give us an insight from behind the scenes. Here is your host, Nick Urison. Welcome to another episode of Amazon Legends. My next guest today has been in the financial tech space for over 25 years and working primarily with startups. So he knows what it's like to do things on a shoestring and he also knows numbers. He is currently the VP of finance and tech of Branded, which is an Amazon aggregator. And when he's not working, uh, he's a true Californian. He likes good food and wine and the wine tasting, and uh, also running golf and sports. So with that, everybody, meet my guest, Darby Brandon. Welcome to the show, Darby. Well, do good. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure to have. You know, you and I, are. They, we share a lot of passions. We share passion for numbers. We share passion for tech. And we share passion for startups. <laughs> so, so you spent 25 years doing that. So... Tell me something that you are doing very well right now. So I think at, at Branded right now, I think what's what's going particularly is that we made an early investment in getting the numbers right. So it's not just, you know, like how we get data from Amazon, but also too is like, how do we get good, good financials? Because it's not just finance is not just about being a scorekeeper and it's telling you how you did. It's actually, it, it can, it can help drive strategy. Strategy. It can help, you know, it can help you make decisions, support the decisions you're, you're, you're going to make. And so, you know, as an aggregator, naturally, you know, we, we have to onboard companies. We're bringing in, you know, um, sellers at various states of their uh, maturity and being able to do this. But one thing that's being become a really common theme for us is that, you know, making this investment early, working on getting the numbers right early at the beginning is, it pays, pays huge dividends down the road. Okay. So when you say investment, you are referring to making an effort to make sure that your numbers are properly yes. in place. Because you know, yeah. don't forget, you are an aggregator. So when I hear an aggregator use the word investment, I'm thinking they are investing. <laughs> that's no, well, that's no it's an investment of money, but also let's, let us not discount the, the investment of time it, it, it takes. But it's, it's, it both, both, have, both, have a, both deliver value. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, there is a concept out there, which is a false concept uh, that some entrepreneurs believe. I care about bringing in the cash. Let me go make up, make my deals instead of getting buried in numbers and financials. And I can always do that later. So let's first go get the dough and then we'll figure out the rest later. So that, because they don't prioritize. So that's a choice. I think you can walk and chew gum at the same time. However, those who make this choice, at some point, you are going to have to get your opening balances right, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, there's, there's two things that I, that I believe about that. One is that it certainly doesn't get easier the longer you wait. And I think to your to your your second your other point is that when you you have to go to a bank, maybe you need to secure financing. Yes, cash is king, and revenue is is you know obviously you have to drive top line first. But sooner or later, you're going to have to show somebody how you've done. And if you don't have you know good solid practices behind those numbers, like and they're you know good quality data, nobody it it, it will cost you literally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it will cost you is an understatement because it will cost you cash, it will cost you time, and it will cost you a, a potential opportunity that you know your your mm -hmm. your timing for something may be perfect, but because yeah. you can't show your numbers or they don't make yeah. sense, yeah, it, it's a big deal. So I, I I'm a big yeah. believer in having the numbers right. Yeah, definitely. So, and I think too, and I think too, when you're selling on Amazon is that you know we aren't the you know we're not selling services we're selling goods and like being able to how we purchase what's our margin how we're doing it's like when you're a seller it's super critical to to know how you're doing not just from a top line standpoint but how are you managing your margin it's yeah you have to start early 
Yeah. So, uh, so Darby, what I want to do is take this opportunity uh, to lay it all out in terms of someone who is not so crazy about numbers, but nevertheless, it's a fact of life. And mm -hmm. to kind of get their act together. Uh, because when we discussed, you mentioned that you drive growth through numbers. So, okay. and then, you know, how those numbers are organized. So lay it out for us. What is the best way for, especially for Amazon sellers to organize their financials? Yeah, well, the first thing is the good news is that it's never been easier to do that in the sense that, you know, most tech, whether it's QuickBooks or you graduate beyond that, it's, it's all software as a service. It's something you could pay for on a subscription basis. And it really doesn't take nearly the time it used to take to, to set up a good, a good baseline uh, fin financial system. And the second thing that we've really noticed as well is that how um, either convoluted or opaque that seller central data can be at, at times, especially when you're trying to know when you, you fulfilled an order, knowing when um, knowing what your, your sales are, how often you can pull it, whether you have one or many seller accounts, it, it can be, you know, relying on seller central alone very quickly will not be, will not be enough. It doesn't, there's not enough, there's not enough information. There's not enough valuable, you know, what you sold, you know, what they, you know, what, um, what Amazon's taken in for your inventory, you know, what they've sold, you know, what fees they've taken, you know, what you paid for either, you know, paid search or pay-per-click, et cetera. Uh, but it's that's not enough, and honestly, that that's not the easiest platform to to do anything with that with that information. Yeah. So, what I know is, I'm sure you've seen this yourself. So, a lot of sellers they they focus on selling stuff, and yep. then they they use FBA. So every settlement period, that's every other week, they yep, get the exactly. Cash. To their bank account so they take that cash and then book it as their revenue so their net deposit is what they declare as their sales and then they are going off of that in terms of how much they sold and then they they have their inventory so give us your take on what you think about this way of accounting <laughs> that's a that's a that's a really good question and i i'm, I'm going to try to not be uh wonky about my uh my 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 answer so it's like um in short i would say that i if you only count things as they happen and when they happen it's not the it's it's actually not the most accurate way to to keep track of your business because like what about those you know you you said on the 15th what about those you know 10 percent of your orders over that period that ship that day that really is revenue really is you know, considered to be money in the bank, but it didn't appear on your settlement report. It's, it's, it's a, it's a blunt and yeah, inaccurate. It sounds like an exaggeration, but it, it's frankly an inaccurate way to know how you're doing. Cause there's, there's too much, there's too much noise in the current moment. You need to be able to know that like, Oh yeah, I've, you know, I received, you know, I received um, a few thousand dollars in inventory and I haven't received the invoice yet. Well, it's like that could, that could, you could overstate your margin um, if you, if you're not accounting for that properly. Um, you know, it's like sometimes I know that some fees sometimes are, don't always, all your fees don't necessarily appear on the current settlement report. If you know you're missing fees, again, you're overstating how, how you're, how you're doing. Likewise, you can, you can understate your your performance if you're not if you're not kind of capturing a few poacher so it's like yes most most sellers start out doing and it's called cash basis accounting but i think very quickly you realize that you know in order to to do like working with the bookkeeper doing proper um even if you have to work with the bookkeeper doing proper accrual based accounting is it really is like when you go to show investors when you go to show um banks how you're doing it's it's really important you you one it shows financial maturity on the part of the seller and the company and it also it's the it's what it's what investors are looking for yeah i just heard you say two very important things one is financial maturity 
So that's what you are advocating for. So if you are a seller and you yeah. want to do, you want to sell one Z's, two Z's as a hobby, we're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about yeah. building it, growing it, and then at some point bringing investors or let, you know, potentially yeah. borrow it, whatever. So therefore, wherever you go, whoever you go to, even if it's your family member, they are going to expect mm -hmm. you to have that financial maturity. So yeah. that's number one. Number two that I heard you mention is cash versus accrual. So cash means that whatever you wrote check for today and whatever cash you deposited today, that's what you declare as income or expense. That does not tell the full story. So you must- That's exactly right. Have the, the, the accrual basis. So um, actually- you are being too kind when you say the things you said, when I ask you how, what your take is. So you know what I say? When, some, when I see somebody doing this, I say, look, why are you bothering with making any entries or anything like that? Yeah. I say, why do you say that? Well, you may as well pull things out of air. It's just as good. <laughs> it doesn't say anything. It doesn't, it doesn't say anything, right? So... Uh, so tell us the right way to organize it then. Well, how should they account for it? So, so really it is even if, and like you don't, and I think what's really key too, Nick, is that you do not have to be an accountant to, to, to take, to learn, to, to, to learn this and to, to be this way. And so I think really is like the single, the single most kind of the, the prime directive almost is that is just make sure that your financials re reflect what actually happened for that for that period, and that's why it's like you do sometimes have to make adjustments to reflect what actually happened because the cash didn't move in or out, and so it's really it's really critical that you you do that. Likewise, you want to make sure like any uh, any paid search spend, any any um, social advertising spend that you did during that time. If you haven't been able to reflect it, either if you say you're using your credit card statement to reflect that, which I do not recommend, um, but say you you know those are the tools you're 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 using to to capture that. Like like you said, if you if you're paying for that, it's just like it isn't it isn't going to work. And also too, it's like it's it's you know we talk about the external the external influence, like whether invest you know events are it, it costs you the credibility you could potentially have with investors, but also you're really like to, if you want to start getting kind of more uh, more candid about it, like you're lying to yourself about how you're doing. Right, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I say you may as well go pull things out of the air. Just put something on the paper that makes you feel good. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, so, yeah. So, um, okay, I want to uh, elaborate on what you said earlier, uh, where you don't have to be an accountant. It has to tell that it has to reflect what's going on, right? That's what the numbers are. So yeah. the way I take that is you make a sale for hundred dollars on Amazon and Amazon mm -hmm. will then pay probably something like $60 into your account after deducting the fees. So how much, what is your sale? The total sale value, is it hundred dollars? Is it $60? Well, of course it's not 60, right? So then why are you showing 60 as your sale, right? So exactly. then, then it's about, okay, but how do I show 100? I only received 60. Well, where did the other 40 go? It went to commission. It went to FBA fee. It went to advertising. Okay, yeah. show that. That doesn't take an accountant to do that. Yeah. 100 minus 10 minus 15 exactly. minus... And, and to your question, why do you do that? I have, I have a question. I'll ask you. I'll answer your question with a question. Uh, when you're uh, applying for a mortgage or... Or something, or somebody asks you what your income is. Do you tell them your net income, what you what you uh, take home on your, you know on your paycheck, or do you tell them what your gross salary is? It's it it it's do people, it is the same thing. It's almost literally the same thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And also, you absolutely want to know how much taxes you are paying because exactly. when the time comes to file your tax return, you want a tax refund, right? So. Yeah, and if you if yeah. you qualify for it, you want to know yeah. how much was deducted. Yeah, yeah, and what's and and what's really critical too is like you know we talk about that, and I think a lot of sellers, you know, almost like take the fees for it. Just they assume it's table stakes, 
it's the cost of doing business. Yes, a lot of ways that's true. However, you should aggressively manage, like, you know, you need to know how well, how much you're spending on, on paid search, how much you're spending on certain keywords. You need to know what that, what that is because is it a good investment? Is it not? And can you, can you improve your net, net revenue by, you know, it's not just your seller fee. It's, you know, you're, we're, everybody pulls different levers as a seller to, uh, to try to drive the top line, which is your gross revenue. But it is like, it, you know, you, it is something you can actively manage. You do have a, you do have levers to pull there. Yeah. So why is it that just playing devil's advocate, I spent $10,000 last month on advertising. This month I spent 18,000. So what, what do I do with it? Why is that important? Um, no, that's, I mean, no, it's a fair question too. It's like, cause a lot of it's like, well, it, it, you, you need to know it, like anytime, you know, just like I said at the beginning of this conversation, it's like investing in numbers is an investment on that. Likewise, your you know, what are you getting with your advertising dollars? You know, how are you, not just how are you spending it, but what are you what are you getting for it? And the only way you can really measure that is like, okay, what kind of it, if you don't account for it, if you don't look at how it flows through to your margin, how it flows through, flows through to your EBITDA, you'll never know what your whether or not was that a good advertising spend. What is that a did that underperform? It's like we invest in advertising because we have an expectation. Typically, the expectation is, yeah, we want to grow sales, well, of course. But also, it's you know how do how do you actually know if that was the right spend? How do you know um, you know kind of putting your product on in somebody's TikTok feed actually actually paid off? It, you have to be able to measure what you're doing, and the only way you can measure it is to look at what the spend was. And what kind of what kind of revenue lift did you did you did you get from it? Okay, so how do you, for the listeners' benefit, how do you make sense of ten thousand dollar ad spend last month was not a good spend, but eighteen thousand this month is a good spend? What determines that? So. I, I wish it was easy to say it's like if you if you invest at ten thousand one month and it gave you twenty thousand dollars in sales and you invest at eighteen thousand and it gave you forty thousand, which is you know one gave you two x, the other gave you a little more than two x. Uh, that that would be yeah, that would be a good that is a good way to measure, but that's not the the only way or the best way. It's kind of like how do you start to you can't just look at at at, at that way because you know, if you, what, how, how, what was the quality of the revenue you did generate from it? You know, did you, did, was that ad coupled with a, with discounting? Therefore, yes, you, you achieved, a, you know, a top line lift, but it, you, you sacrificed margin in order to, to get there. And so it's, it's, you know, it's like, you can, it's one thing to say, you can't just look at advertising investment, top line growth, it's advertising investment, top line growth, margin growth, EBITDA growth. And you really have to measure it on all of those vectors to know what a good investment versus a bad investment. And it could be that that 10,000 investment that yielded less, less top line growth, but had stronger margin performance was the right investment. And those are, and that's, I mean, this little thought experiment we just did really is kind of, that is how, that is how numbers support decisions and drive decisions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what I was trying to um, illustrate uh, is it's not about the numbers as hard numbers, so to speak, but it's the percentages that you yeah. go by. So uh, 10, and also it's not just one thing, but it's several things. So first of all, you, you know, you mentioned margin. What is margin? Margin is the difference between what you paid and what you got. So if you yeah. want to talk about uh, merchandise, your yeah. landed cost, your landed cost is, say, $10, and then yeah. your selling price is 30 So therefore, yeah. your your margin is 30 Yeah, right there. Your gross is exactly. 
percent. So, um, so that means that thirty percent of your sales go to buying the product, and then you spend on that thirty dollars sale, spend three dollars on advertising. That means ten percent went to uh, advertising. So. 30% merchandise, 10% advertising, 5%, 15% Amazon commission. Now we're talking yeah. about a model, right? So yeah. uh, that's what you're referring to when you say numbers tell the story and we're looking at the percentages and then we're making the decision. So therefore, perhaps the $10,000 spent was maybe 20%, uh, but at the same time, it gave 8% net, net bottom line versus when 18,000, maybe that was 12% of the sale, but now your net bottom line became 12%. So exactly. that's a much better. Yeah. So that's what, so at the end of the day, accounting does not require really technical knowledge. What you wanna know is condition yourself to think in terms yeah. of percent. And that's exactly. what, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, because I think it's, yeah, it's important for any, and there is a literacy, like we, you know, we talk about financial maturity and like financial literacy. And that's exactly, I think what you just described is a perfect way of saying, what does financial literacy look like as a seller or a, um, or, or, or even a company, an aggregator in this, in this space? It is like, you can read a financial statement. You can, you can go through there and you, you look at the numbers and you can read the story that the numbers are, are, are telling you. And exactly, and that percentages are the language that that story is most often told it, you know and then percentages turn into metrics and kpis and we could we could go crazy with that but it right. is really a matter of you know it's like can you get down you know you start to get to into you know average gmv versus you know kind of average you know average net per transaction and you can really you can really start to have fun with those numbers yeah okay so let's talk a little bit about making it a little bit more complicated, so to speak. Okay. When you bring it, so it's one thing to make a sale for uh, $30 and then you pay $10 for the item. Yeah. That's fine. But when you bring the inventory into the whole mix, things get complicated, right? I see you smiling. So that's that's where the pain is, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's why I said it, it is. It's you know, especially as Amazon sellers, it is. It's even more critical to to get on top of it early, is because you know part of it is you know okay if cash is king, how do you deploy your cash in inventory? The single biggest influence on how you deploy your cash will always come from inventory, and so okay, great. So how do I how do I measure inventory? How do I know what's a good what's a good stock level? And how to, so I think it's two things. One is that you have to, as a seller, you have to understand how your supply chain works. And so, first of all, like how long does it take, it, take it to get an item? If you're sourcing that item from China, that means that the manufacturer is going to sell it. You're going to buy it. It gets put on a container. That container gets put on a ship. That ship travels across the Pacific. It ends up in the US. How long does that journey take? And so really... Every, every item, you should always know what your lead time is. And then you need to know, like, so if it's, if it's an item that costs you $5 per unit and you need to have, um, you need to have, like, it's a 90-day lead time, you need to have at least 90 days of stock on hand if you intend to not miss a sale associated with it. And so it's like, there's so much related to inventory, inventory, how you measure inventory, how to turn your inventory, just like, you know, you look at margin or you look at your, your profitability as percentages. Um, it's really important to look at metric, met, look at inventory as, as metrics as well. Like how many, you know, how do you measure your inventory in terms of days on hand? How do you compare days on hand to lead time for specific items or specific, specific categories? How do you use that information to make your next buying decision? Or if your days of stock starts to expand and you're not buying more then you know you have a pricing issue or you have excess inventory on hand which means you have sunk cash in a lot of ways to describe where where you are and it's it's yes as important it is to for investors to show how you do from a profitability standpoint as a seller understanding your inventory position and how how much cash you can or should or should not be deploying to inventory is it, it i mean it's like 
it, data is like the business circulatory system, cash is the financial circulatory system, but the vital signs, you know, we, we, we really got to check the vital signs and that is days of inventory on hand, gross margin, EBITDA margin as percentages, uh, you know, how are you driving top line growth? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a, I, I have a question for you. I asked this question to several people and they couldn't give me an answer. Maybe there isn't a, a coined phrase, but there is a, a metric that is, to me, is the most important. And the metric is your net liquidity in terms of dollars. Divide by total amount of inventory you're holding at any point in time. So as you know, you, you can have a fairly healthy margin, net, net, net margin of let, yeah. let's call it 25%, okay? Let's be generous, 25%. And then let's also be generous that you are doing a million dollars a month, okay? That means you are netting quarter of a million dollars every month, right? I wanna meet that seller. <laughs> So, so now, okay, so let's take this scenario. So I say to you, okay, how much inventory would you be holding in order to sustain that kind of a performance? Well, I can tell you it's going to be a few million dollars, right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, yes. And so, so let's, let's also be even as gen generous with our landed costs. Let's say that we're paying 20%, okay, landed. That means two hundred thousand dollars to to service that million dollar sale. We are we have to have sold two hundred thousand dollars worth. So yeah. typical lead time is ninety days today. So that means that you have at least three months, if not more, that you're going to be holding in stock. Three months. Let's let's also be extremely efficient, and then we are turning over every three months on the dot. Yes. So. That means $600,000, right? So with these healthy, healthy margins and healthy performance levels, you still go three months without putting a dime in your pocket, right? No, that's that, that's correct. Well, and also too, it's like you, you know, that's assuming too, is that you have 90 days of inventory on hand. It has a 90 day lead time. And actually too, it's, it's I mean, that's the thing. And that's where the last couple of years have been so challenging for everybody is that the the lead time equation went out of whack. Right. And, and so it it's like, and it and that's the that's not even the opportunity cost. That is the that is the physical cost of of having of not having good, reliable lead time visibility, because then you find yourself having to deploy more cash. Right. To for two inventory, which means you're carrying more days of inventory on hand. It means so that payback period lengthens even more uh, on on that. So it is important. So it's, I think, I think I actually like your 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 calculation there. Is that it is kind of like the golden the golden ratio uh, for, of inventory, and and I think too is just like it is factoring it is factoring the other very the biggest variable too that that isn't part of it is you know what is your you know it's it's really turning that into days of inventory on hand relative to days of lead time and assuming too that you you your pricing strategy well let's not talk about pricing yet but it's like yes exactly it's like in terms of just cash management liquidity managing optimizing your liquidity it's like that's why yeah that's why everybody who's come out of the last two years sharper on supply chain is really just setting themselves up well for the next few years because right. you know, we're seeing you know, China's opening up we're seeing the supply chain situation beginning to stabilize and it's it is an, it, like getting good during that really rough time is going to pay off right? yeah exactly yeah I mean uh, this is so uh, so net net liquidity per month divided mm -hmm. by inventory value on hand, what do you call that metric? Oh, I, I mean, it's like, I'm going back to like my undergrad days. I'm calling it the current ratio. I don't know what it's called, what it's called. I, I've never well, seen... No, 
so it's like okay so like wow it's like, i didn't realize i have to like i i, I miss my textbooks right now and we still have <laughs> physical textbooks back then um no it's like so the current 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 assets divided by current liabilities is called your current ratio what you're doing is you're, you're peeling you're peeling a couple layers of the onion on the current ratio because what you're doing is you're taking ar out of the equation you're taking cash cash on hand out of the equation and really as you're looking at you're looking at like capital allocation to cash allocation or capital allocation to inventory. So that's almost like, I, I don't have a, I, I, I wasn't taught like a name for that metric, but it is like, it is a KPI that anybody who is selling needs to, needs to, to keep a handle on, but it is. And also too, cause like, it's, it's almost like an amalgamation of you know, your current ratio plus your uh, days, a day's inventory on hand plus you know days days uh day you know inventory turnover time it's like you're you've kind of you kind of like you know cobbled together this little mosaic metric of of how you get to like what is your magic what is your magic inventory position so you know where this came from so my interest in this came from People that I, I meet, not necessarily clients, clients for sure, of course, because I can see their numbers, but uh, I'm talking to people, you know, actually some podcast guests, sellers, and and I ask them because very quickly the, the, the conversation becomes lack of cash. So, so I, I say to them, do you ever feel like your sales are growing? Because they're very good at driving sales, you know, keywords and ranking and all that stuff. Do you ever feel like sales are growing? You're growing as a company, as an operation, and your profitability is good. You're making good margin when you sell, but you never have any cash. Do you ever think that we, we're doing very well, we're growing, our margins are healthy, and, and how come we never have cash? And there's always need. And then the saying that the, the more you grow, the more cash you're going to need is also is, is because of that. So I, so, so, so I asked them, do you ever feel that way? I said, all the time. And so I, then I asked this question, okay, how much cash is going to kill this problem for good? Well, they don't know. They don't know. I say to them, okay, show me, show me your not show me your numbers, show me you know that dashboard and business uh, business reports that total sales. I say, okay, your margin is so much. So I say, okay, let me see. You are short about 85 grand. How did you know that? <laughs> well, guess what I did? I did the calculation that I just mentioned. It it tells you exactly right on the spot. Well, I think what's I think really what I took away from that too is that sellers most sellers don't know how much what is the ideal inventory because they don't know how much inventory they need to have on here on that and it's not just like x number of dollars of inventory i mean you do need to get to that but it's like how many days of inventory do i need to have to not be over over wrote, have too much cash deployed to inventory and not too little such that i'm missing sales and and we all know we all know the impact uh, that out of stock positions have on Amazon when you're, you know, you, you fall in, you fall in this, in the search results, you fall there. So it's like, it really is every, anybody who sells anything, you know, really should have an ideal position of like, okay, our ideal inventory position is, you know, is $2 million of this product, but they need to understand why they need to understand what that they need to understand it in, day, in terms of days of stock. And I do think that, you know, on Amazon, it becomes even more, if you're a physical retailer, you're out of stock on something, you've got, you've missed a sale. Um, but, and that person may or may not come back next week if you have it in stock. If you lose that sale on Amazon, because you're out of stock, not only you, you, you fall in the search rankings, you fall in the search results, it's, it, it's less likely that that customer is going to come back to is going to be able to come back to your listing uh on on that so it's like i really yeah i do think you're you're on to something with like just kind of like in terms of being able to hone into that value of that metric and sellers being able to kind of manage manage to that i mean not to not to open up our 
our hood, but it's like, I mean, those are, those are questions we always are looking to answer uh, in our, you know, and, and we, you know, what we add on to it is like, oh yeah, well, this is what we have, but like, where are the open POs? What's, what's literally sitting in the middle of the Pacific right now? It's like, and we, you know, that, that's the type of ability, visibility that we're driving towards always and making sure we have as clean a view of that as possible. Well, you know, uh, Darby, what, what I've seen with people is they they don't really start off with a model first. So I think the right way to do it is start off with your model. What is your model in terms of how much you're going to sell the item for and what are you going to net from that? So taking into account Amazon commission, uh, advertising, blah, blah. And of course, we all know that you're going to bleed for about three, four months on advertising. So take that into account and then put it over a, you know, a 12 month time frame. So then look at that, how much net net profit you hope to generate from that. But while generating that net profit, how much inventory you are going to need to be carrying in order to service those sales and your growth. And guess what? That, exactly. that, that, that shortfall is the money that you're going to have to go raise before you do anything. Otherwise, you'll end up exactly where most people I speak to end up. Where yeah. well, we're doing fine and we're growing, but you know we never have any money so that they have sleepless nights, they can't pay their vendor bills and blah, 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 and then the operation suffers, right? Yeah. Yeah, I wish I could have, uh, I wish I had our treasury, our head of treasury uh, sitting there because he's really strong at managing our banking relationships and really understanding because there is, I mean, I think what, what helps it too is understand like what instruments, what financial instruments are available to, man to, to manage through those types of periods and also what are the right ones for the business itself uh, on, on that because I think it's, you know, it, there, there's different, you know, it's not, it's not a one size fits all model. It's not a, Hey, I need, you know, a, you know, a 90 day line of credit to, to finance my way. Maybe that's, but there's, there's so many receivables finance. There's so many instruments available to do that. And I think that's, you know, we talk about the financial literacy of a seller. It's like getting, getting savvy about this fairly quickly or having, or just as importantly, having trusted advisors, who can guide you through to navigate those those areas is is super critical. Yeah. So let's now go a, a, a one more step into the complexity. So uh, we are talking about knowing how much inventory you carry at any point in time. How how do you do that? Because it's moving target, right? So you 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 are receiving inventory from your supplier. Send it to Amazon. Amazon is selling some of it. You're holding some of it in the warehouse. So how do you know real time? So it, it is literally a moving target. Um, so so what we do is um, it is how often we 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 started out pulling um, you know pulling pulling data from just like anybody. We started pulling data you know per settlement period twice a month uh, off a of, off a of seller central. And for all the reasons that you just said we knew very quickly that that wasn't sufficient on that. And so, you know, the way, the way we do it is probably the way that you know, any, any company with the, you know, ERP system does it where it's, you know, so it's the, the, the movements of the target really come from, yes, what you have on hand, what you, you know, orders, orders that have been fulfilled. So how much has gone out the door already, but also like the, the variable that is probably the toughest to, to solve, and it's not a variable, it's, it's a data point, is you know, what does in-transit inventory look like? And you know, we spend, our supply chain team spends a lot of time making sure that we have a good handle on, on that, that component of it. And I think the more, you know, just like invested, the more, the more you can automate that process, the sooner you can automate it, the better, just like, the sooner you can automate your finance processes, the better, um, because it is, it's like to answer your question is that you, you know, you need to understand all of the inputs that actually reflect what your, what your stock position is, or more importantly, what your stock position is going to be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks from now and be, and beyond on that. So a lot of the work we do is not, I mean, it's, 
probably the the two easiest things to do are to to issue a PO to buy to buy merchandise and then to receive that merchandise at the, at, at Amazon or at the warehouse. Everything that happens in between and after the fact or you know are just as important. And until you do all of that, it's not going to be accurate enough. It's yeah. probably you know emphasis on enough because you can always you, you can always kind of like say, well, like, yeah, I know I, I placed an order, you know, 30 days ago, it's a 90 day lead time. So it'll, I, it'll be here in two months. You know, you can, yeah, most of the time it's probably accurate enough, but it is like the more you can. And again, it's like, they're not variables, they're data points. And the more, the more you can actually, you know, instead of forecasting that you can actually have actual data to support that the, the, and being able to consume that data in a timely manner is the the better off you'll be. Yeah, well, I mean, the, there is the, this is this is the hardest part. You know, people always ask me that they they, they want to sell on Amazon or they want to sell online or uh, they're asking about advertising. You know, website, all the software systems, keywords, and I say, look, your biggest challenge of selling online. It's nothing to do with advertising or systems or keywords or anything like that. The biggest challenge is demand planning. That's what it is. Because first of all, you run out of run out of inventory, you're dead in the water. Yeah. Everything you've done goes out the window. So yeah. that's awesome. The second thing is if you don't know how to plan for your inventory. You are going to do one of the two things. You are either going to buy too much yep. or you're going to buy too little. If you buy too little, you're losing sales. If you buy yep. too much, now you're going to strangulate the company yep. with the cash yep. resources because it's going to be time to pay for it before you've sold the whole thing. So, and, and being able to calculate accurately enough how much to carry in stock is the hardest part of the the, the whole operation and I and I say and this also comes in two different uh, aspects one is how many pieces should I order that means you need to know how many pieces you have at Amazon how many pieces you have in the warehouse how many pieces you have on an open PO exactly so if you don't know these things how are you going to know how much more to order whether or not you should order so if you don't, if you if you're missing one of these pieces, you're gonna either order little or too much. So, yeah. and and this comes down to having systems and everything else, right? Yeah, yeah. And I would also, yes, that's exactly right. And that's you know our the work we do with our systems is exactly to to make that better. Is in you know it's always and like you know de plan, demand planning is yes we we have a demand planning module in our. Our, our ERP. And it is really because I think too is that, you know, what, what, you know, we talk about, you know, what does a successful seller look like? And, you know, a term that gets bandied about a lot is, oh, they, they're executing really well. Like this, okay, this seller knows how to execute. And I think that the default perception of ex good execution looks like oh yeah okay they're selling a lot well actually it's everything you just described where it's are they you know are they optimizing their inventory are they you know are they do they you know have the right inventory levels are they turning their inventory at the appropriate levels when they need to turn inventory faster do they know what levers they need to pull likewise when they see an opportunity to to improve margins are they able to take advantage of that as as well and so you know that they're kind of like the the core of execution really does come down to inventory management because it it feeds it really it is the flywheel that feeds everything else yeah yeah i mean the, that's it i mean you, you you hit the nail on the head in the core of six the, the the success that you're looking for is all in the inventory management and uh, so for that you need to definitely have systems in place that report yeah. real time, not every two weeks, not yeah. by posting the net deposit you receive into 
<laughs> so you need to know real time. And of course, that real time means also how much you've sold up until that point so that you can see at that point how much inventory you're holding. And that's like a, a, a you know, a chart that keeps yeah. Yeah. going up and down, up and down. Yeah. And of course, the, the more discount means less margin. Less margin means more cash you need. As you know, in comparison, so yeah. um, so Darby, uh, let's have you share some healthy numbers for us. What should sellers aim for in terms of margins, at least as an aggregator to look uh, appealing to an aggregator, also as a as a business? Yeah, I I mean, you know, I think first and foremost that that really like what we you know I obviously can't share like margin numbers or like I would even say too when we look at sellers to potentially um, bring onto our platform where we don't have like a target margin. And I think too, what's really, what's really critical and like kind of going back to my experience, like I, I started out in retail, like you know, brick and mortar retail. My first, my first job out of school was Gap Inc. Um, so apparel and boy, you talk about apparel margins versus like CPG margins. Um, the numbers, you wouldn't even think that, yeah, like the numbers aren't even denominated in the same scale. Uh, when you when you look at that so it's like you know first and foremost it's I, I think it's really like you know talking to sellers and kind of talking to sellers and it, I, it is really important to know what a good margin looks like for that category you know like if you're if you're selling food like you know food is notorious especially just in terms of the um the cost structure and the margin started for, for food and the spoilage numbers it's you know a healthy margin could be a healthy gross margin could be somewhere in the in the twenties, whereas like apparel, you know, depending on how strong of an apparel brand you are, you know, forties, fifties more is is totally possible. Like like what we you know what we do, it really you know like when we buy a seller, you know, we don't look at what you know we look at their margins and we look at how they're executing, um, but also we look at what it should be and what we think we could make it, you know, where we think we could help them get to. If they were to, you know, if they, they were to come under our, come onto our platform and, and and work with us, so it's like, yeah, I wish I could come on and say like, oh yeah, the magic number is life, the universe, and everything forty two, but it, you know, there's you know, it really depends on what you're selling, um, you know, the space you're in, you know, kind of like what you know, what is your position in the space? Are you, a, you know, kind of like are you an emerging brand, a challenger? Are you an established brand? Um, where does this, you know, what is your product mix? Where does this item fit your product? Mix? Is it a cash cow or you're just trying to, uh, or is this an, an, an item where you can maximize margin because it's mature or established? Or, you know, are you trying to, you know, are you trying to establish a foothold? Then you're willing to, you're willing to give up margin to, you know, to build your customer base. So it's such a, such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I just wanted to see your take, but yeah. you're right. I mean, like electronics, for example, electronics. Yeah, yeah. Not good luck getting the kind of margins. However, if you create your own line of accessories yeah. for uh, electronics, then there yeah. you could have total different. And in addition, yeah. your price point matters, right? So if price point is higher uh, versus lower, so that will determine. So, however, I'm going to give you a number. Okay. So this is, we're talking Amazon, strictly Amazon. So in order to create a viable business on Amazon and frankly survive, you know, for a fact, some things are, you know, already, you're going to pay 15% to Amazon. Yep. You're going to pay roughly depending on how, heavy and bulky your item is, and hopefully it's not because those are not worth doing FBA for. So unless you yeah, charge, yeah. so let, let's assume add say another 15% for your FBA fee. So already 30%. So you know for a fact that best case scenario, if optimized and you've done your homework and the legwork to build your following, you are likely to achieve somewhere around 10 to 15% takeoffs. So now we are up to 45. Yep. So 45% already gone before buying the merchandise. So how much money do you wanna make? 
So we talk about generous, generous operation of 25%. You're not making 25% net. So at yeah. best, you are making maybe 20% at best. So, so now that leaves you with 35% left to buy the merchandise. So, I mean, at the end of the day, these are the facts. So if you want to make less money, then the business loses its appeal, then you can afford to pay more for the merchandise. If you prepare to, if you want to make more money, then you're going to have to really buy it real cheap. So, so these are the, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, this is the landscape. Would you agree? Yeah. I, I would agree. And I think actually I'll, I'm going to use a category that we're not in. So it's, it's a, it's a, but it's a really good example is this. I my, my actually, when talking about that exact model, my favorite category to use an example is actually um, iPhone cases where it's oh. like, yeah. Cause like I always, I always buy, whenever I get a new phone, I, the day I order the phone, I also order my, my new case on there. And is there a category that has such a broad price range and such a broad like margin point than than uh phone accessories on amazon uh on that and it's like and it's funny because it's like it's like all of the dynamics you play there you have you have some good brand identity with some like brands like spigen out there likewise you know i kind of you know apple obviously has their presence and there's so much you you got to think that the the cost of the the cost of the the cost of goods range for these for these items are pretty pretty narrow but the price range is really broad and so it's like how do how do how are sellers able to achieve that type of uh, differentiation or that type of price differentiation and be successful and i think really what it is is like some you know some players and i always to be honest with you i usually buy something on the cheaper side as opposed to the you know that the, the high end and so it's like so what a like well what's the difference what are these sellers trying what is the seller who's selling a case of 15 bucks versus a, a seller who's selling a case of 50 bucks what are they well clearly one is saying like i'm willing to grab one out of every five ten sales to to make that 25 percent margin that 25 percent margin that you're talking about whereas you know, there's, you know, there's sellers, I assume those sellers who are selling cases for, you know, 10, 12, 15 bucks, they're, they're scraping by sequel digit, but they're saying they're, it's a volume play and they're making a volume play to, to, to do that. And so it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting dynamic where it's, you know, it's when you have a, a well-populated or even a saturated space category space out there, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like I think there's the sellers there are picking a lane, and you know I don't know who's more successful. It depends on I think it depends on the category. It depends on the seller and how well the seller executes. Yeah, well, you know, I, I can tell you this. I don't know what percentage, but I know for a fact that it's more than fifty percent of those sellers that are selling yeah, this stuff. They don't even know what they're talking about. Yeah. They have no idea. They have no idea how much money they are making. By the time the dust settles, they have no idea. They are thinking top line, okay, we sell, okay, we give discount so much, and then you know we'll, we'll make up on the volume. But they have no idea of what is actually left in the bottom line. They don't know. Yep. They don't know how much inventory they're carrying. So they're just going about doing it, and that's why they come and go. But uh, most only a small percentage actually know, and and they know better not to go into that yeah. kind of. Oh, we'll make up on the volume idea. It just doesn't work. Yeah. This yeah. this is great. I mean, we we had we talked numbers, but really we didn't get too technical. Uh, so I I just wanted to have that real life yeah. experience. What, how important numbers are. No, no, definitely. Well, that's good. It's, I think, and that's that, that. Hopefully, that was that that made the point. That made your point, and hopefully, made my point as well. Where it is, it's like you use the numbers. Then it's not about the numbers. Well, it's every. It's all about the numbers, and it's not about the numbers all at the same time. In the sense that, it's what do you do with the numbers? What 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 are you able to? You know, how how are numbers your compass? How are the numbers telling you what what you how you did and what you need to do? Yeah. Uh, on that, and that's your story. Numbers, numbers do, like you said earlier, numbers do tell your story. Yeah, I mean, I, I loved how you put it. You want the sellers to demonstrate 
a level of financial maturity. And that is key to, to a, a lender, to a potential investor, or someone who's gonna acquire you. Without that financial maturity, I mean, what are you doing? Uh, this, yeah. is, this is business, right? So, so Darby, so tell us a little bit about yourself. So uh, let's go way back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? Give us your uh, beginnings. Yeah, so I grew up in I grew up in Northern California, um, a couple hours north of uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco, in a beautiful Mendocino County. That's where the uh, the, the affinity for 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 wine uh, came came from. Literally growing up around it. Uh, likewise, um, attended uh, attended college uh, here in here in the Bay Area. You know, kind of felt no reason to leave the Bay Area, and you know, definitely got more and more and more embedded in in Silicon Valley culture, and you know, it's it. You know, love love calling it home. So I, uh, you know, ra raised my family here, and you know, spent my spent my entire career here. And, you know, I started like I said, I started out in retail and brick and mortar retail uh, with Gap. Um, spent time in grocery. Uh, spent my first e commerce experience. I, I consulted with Walmart.com for uh, four years, uh, a decade ago. And and when I was at Gap too, I was uh, doing I was doing finance for their online when they're growing launching the online business, growing in the online business, and really learning the value of like managing inventory, managing fulfillment costs, um, and and really seeing kind of like you know again it's not about the online presence, it's about how do you how, how do you move the goods as effectively as possible, and so you know after spending kind of like most of my career in large enterprise scale companies, I really used the pandemic as you know, out of necessity and also out of passion to really pivot into, you know, during the pandemic, I, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was working for Uber and building their building their, their next generation FinTech platform, their next generation ERP platform. And then um, during the pandemic, I pivoted to working with startups, uh, helping them make their software selections, helping them make their, um, you know, what is the right financial system path for them? And yes, exactly. Like the story we just we just talked about today is really where I, I see there's a ton of a, a, a ton of satisfaction for me, fulfillment for me in that. It's one thing to, you know, working with companies who've been doing this for 20, 30 years and working in systems like this kind of thing, but doing exactly what we just talked about, getting, you know, startups to see the value, being able to solve for scale early, being able to, to jump into this world is so, it, there's, it's so important. It's, it's, and it can, it, it can really set set small companies, startups, sellers on the, on the right path. It's, and it, you know, it could be the difference in them succeeding or failing. Yeah. And uh, why do you think that appeals to you? Um, I think what I, you know, cause I think it's like there's between being a builder versus a, somebody who's you know, always trying to kind of like make an existing system more efficient, like working in the Ubers, the gaps, the big companies in the world, it's really all about taking like, okay, this, this system, this, 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 this finance organization and this system has gotten bloated. It's, you know, oh, we're spending too much here. How do we grab efficiency out of it versus, and, and you learn a lot doing that. You learn what best practices are. I learned what best practices are. I learned what, what works and what doesn't and like how to like, you know, how, how companies get to where, like, how do you get to this point where, you know, part of your system is kind of bloated and needs to be, be trimmed back? Well, knowing what that is and kind of being able to build it out of the gate without that, you know, without setting them on that path. Because what happened is like, you know, at the beginning, you know, something was set up in such a way that you're, you, you got set on that path to, on the path to, in, put on the path to inefficiency or changes made along the way. And like knowing, knowing how those, what the root causes of those, it's really a lot of fun to be able to, you know, build something and try to build something. I wouldn't say build something right the first time because you, you always iterate, but knowing kind of like where, where those guardrails are and, you know, guardrails without the bureaucracy, without the overhead, without the excessive overhead, it's a, it's a fun way to try to, to try to build. And so, yeah, the last few years of doing that has been, it's, it's been a blast. So you know how it is with startups, especially mm -hmm. you've got so many things to do and yep. the resources are limited. The time is limited and everything is yep. needed. 
So, and then wherever, and then you figure out something, you turn uh, and then bump into something else that also yeah. needs to be. So, I mean, that's the story, right? So yeah. this kind of, obviously is not for everyone. Uh, it's not for those at least who want to come to work every day and just do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So Well, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways too, it's probably, I agree with you completely. And in a lot of ways too, it's probably for more than, more than they think. Like there's probably more people who are suited for this than actually know they are in, in some ways. Cause it's, you know, everything is a, you know, getting used to working in a huge organization. It's, it's something you have to train and learn how to do working in a startup and getting used to the velocity and the, the flexibility, the, you know, to air quotes, flexibility of a, uh, of a startup is again, it's a learned behavior. It's a, it's a, it's a muscle you have to, you have to develop. And it really was like, what started out as like an exercise and a thought experiment and cross training. And like, how do you apply, you know, how do you apply the right level of a big company structure into a startup and make it run efficiently? You know, that was kind of like the hypothesis and what is that right level? And, you know, kind of done it you know, twice, twice now uh, in the last couple of years. And so it's been it's 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 been a really fun um, exercise. Why, why why do you think that kind of work appeals to you? Um, I I really think it's for me it is it is that idea of of being able to like like what I always say is you know my the design principle here is like how do we solve for scale? And it is the idea of like you know kind of I I like the idea of like you know, seeing future scale and say building a platform that can support it or at least be be able to support it and grow as it grows versus like, oh my God, how do we, you know, I don't know if the platform can handle the scale. It's like, how do we, you know, how do we, challenge. how do we deal with so excessive scale? Yeah. Is it the challenge? Is it the unknown? Is it the money? Is it, what what is, what is it that drives um, it's it's certainly the um, it's certainly the 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 it's certainly the challenge and it's certain actually in in some ways it's a challenge and in other ways I it in some ways it is easier to start from scratch uh, yeah. on that it's it is easier to not as to you know not have to you know, I wouldn't say you know what, having to clear out kind of you know decisions that have created that had unintended consequences if you if you will it's like granted. You know, I don't know what un, un, unintended consequences some of the decisions I made will have, but it is like you know building kind of like knowing what some of the key principles are, some of the key design and build principles are, doing that, executing those, and then seeing how it how it supports the scale. Because I mean, being an aggregator, that is like the the key thing. It's not about you know how much top line growth can we achieve by acquiring brands. It really is like how do we you know, how do we solve for scale. Like how, like, you know, we, we onboard more brands, how, how efficiently, how quickly can we bring them on board? Yeah, you know, it's not, we don't want, we don't want them, you know, we don't require brands to have them operate autonomously. We acquire brands to, you know, hopefully they can take advantage of the platform we've built. And that's been, a, that, you know, and likewise, it's like, how do you, how do you create a platform that the business can take advantage of? Like, and what it, what's cool about being in an aggregator is where it's like, that financial platform really is foundational. It is it is foundational to being able to solve for scale. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I hear you. It's you know the interesting thing is, and this really is the the bottom line here. It doesn't matter how many guests I have, and people who love creating stuff. Not one of them says it's because of money. Money is a byproduct. It's always because they like the challenge, they like the impact, they like to uh, improve themselves or whatever the case may be. So uh, this is the case. This was a great Darby. So tell us, how can people reach you? Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, Darby Brennan on LinkedIn. My uh, Twitter is Darby S. Brennan. I'm happy to provide you links to all of my relevant con contact information. And personally, you can reach me at Darby at DarbyBrennan.com. Great. Thank you very much, Darby. This was great. And I'm sure people will put what they heard to good use. Thank you. I, I, so good conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Good times. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Darby. This brings Thank us to the end of another episode. And I'll see you on the next one.
If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the episode and share it with someone you think would benefit from it too.